Hello everybody, you may have heard England have somehow managed to get to a Euro 2020 final. So I thought I'd bring in the big guns, Harry Simeu, Chronicles of Aguna. We're not talking about Arsenal today, we're not even going to talk about the All or Nothing series that I'm sure a lot of Arsenal fans head in hands all about. We are going to talk about England versus Italy. And Harry, you've got, I'd say, a very in-depth knowledge about Serie A and a lot of these players. I mean, how do you think it is as a matchup for England? Because I think on paper, you know, Italy have played the best football in the tournament so far. Do you think it's a real test on Sunday? Yeah, it is a real test um, for sure. I think, you know, we were talking just off air there that, you know, people have slept on Italy or did sleep on Italy going into the tournament. And then, you know, they really sort of turned it on in their first couple of group games and everybody was like, whoa, you know, this is a team that we've completely sort of overlooked. They've gone under a massive, they, they've gone through a massive transformation under Roberto Mancini. Um, stylistically, they're not what you expect from Italian sides in the past, but they showed, I thought, against Spain in the semi-final that they can revert back to that if they need to. And they do still have that grit and they are still as streetwise as Italian sides have been in the past. I, I make England favourites, though, because, you know, first of all, I think England have, have grown into the tournament. I think they've they've done a lot better than people expected. I think Gareth Southgate's managed it impeccably well. But Home advantage for me is huge. It is yeah. massive. And, um, you know, I, I was at the Italy game on Tuesday against Spain. Felt like a home game for them that night because there were so many Italian fans in the ground. But I expect Wembley to be dominated by by English fans on the weekend. And they're going to have not only a very difficult opponent, Italy, to deal with, they're going to have to put up with the crowd. You know, there will be difficult moments for England and at, at certain points in the game, I'm sure. But having that sort of extra bit of support is, is in my opinion, you know, quite a, a big advantage and could prove the difference. I, th I think England fans, we need it. We need a bit of disruption to this Italian side because I think Italy have been, for me, infallible at times in this tournament, the way that they can control the tempo. The, and, and tactically, Mancini is so spot on and it's exciting football. But where I feel that Italy may struggle is if England can disrupt the tempo a little bit. And I know Southgate is not really adopted a high press aggressive style, but I wonder whether if we can try and get at Italy's midfield. And I say try because trying to get the ball off Jorginho, Verratti, Barella is really, really difficult. Is it is it a bit too cliche to say it's a game that's going to be won in the midfield? Or do you feel that that's where Italy's strength lies? I think that's where it, it, it's in Italy's interest to make the game sort of flow through the midfield to to focus on that area to not you know you look at the wide areas I think England for example are much stronger in the wide areas I think when you look at what England have on the flanks and you look at their fullbacks I, I don't really see much weakness there if I'm gonna sort of pick out a weakness in the England side and you're not gonna like this as a West Ham man but I oh. think <laughs> it's not it's not just Declan Rice I think him and Calvin Phillips are a functional midfield pairing but I do think there are things that they lack as a pairing uh, that the Italians have. I think physically, Rice and Phillips are are up to the level, and I think they could, you know, they could dominate that way. But I think they they're not very press resistant. They're not very progressive in their passing. I don't think in comparison to the Italian midfield, and I think you know that area could could definitely be key for sure. Oh. <laughs> no, do you know what? I think it is an interesting point you mentioned about Declan and Calvin because they hadn't played too many games together before the tournament. And I always felt that they could work together because of what they do off the ball. I think Calvin's probably impressed me a fair bit with, with a lot of the pressing that he's doing off the ball and the energy that he brings. I think Declan, for West Ham, I have seen him where he has been more press resistant. I have seen him where he's playing through the lines. But with a lot of these players in this tournament, it feels like they have to grow into it. And I... I worry a little bit about the pressure that Italy are going to put on those two early doors. And it's going to force them into issues where do, do we sit? Do we sit a bit deeper or do we go and press them? And, and we could get caught out. And that that is my real concern. And and clearly, Jorginho and Verratti are so composed. I mean, Verratti's impressed me. It impresses me every time I watch him. But for a player that can play in a more advanced role rather than a sitting position and keep the ball as well as he does, that's that's a real problem area for England. Yeah, and, and when I say that about Rice and Phillips, I don't mean it sort of disrespectfully to them as individuals. Um, it's just the role that they're doing in the England team for me is a role that limits them a little bit. You know, I think for Declan Rice, I think Declan Rice is incredibly effective at screening the back four. Um, but is he 
the man that's going to break open a defence with a pass from a deep position. No, but you don't expect that from him because that's not what Declan Rice is about. Calvin Phillips, for me, has been really physical in this tournament and that's given him the upper hand against a lot of players. I thought against Croatia, for example, in the first game where he was the man of the match, that was largely because he was able to get across the pitch. He was able to make his sort of physical presence count and not because I thought that he was impeccable technically. The thing is with this Italian midfield is they've got both. You know, they're not going to be bullied. They're not going to be pushed off of the ball, but they also have the quality when they're in possession to make things happen. And, you know, you're talking about players that have won Champions Leagues. You're talking about, uh, you know, Marco Verratti playing at Paris Saint-Germain. You're talking about Nicolo Barella, Serie A winner last season. And, you, and then you look beyond that and they can bring people like Manuel Locatelli on as well. And yeah. that's that's why I feel like Italy have the upper hand in the midfield. But there are other areas where I'd give England the upper hand. So it's going to be really interesting. It is tough. We are crying out for a, a deep line number six that can just control the tempo. Like a Pedri. If only a Pedri yeah. could turn... I mean, Pedri's more advanced, to be fair to him. But just a player like that that gets on the front foot. Now... I want to talk a little bit about the, the Italian centre backs, Bonucci and, and Cellini. Uh, for me, they're, they are they're being tasked a little bit with playing a little bit higher than they're used to. They can obviously revert to that low block, and they're fantastic at it. And we saw that in the Spain game where they were able to just to sit a bit deeper. Do you think Southgate looks at those two, maybe Cellini, because of some of the movement of Morata and Dani Almo, and thinks if I can pull Sterling onto him a little bit, it's going to cause them issues with some pace. Yeah, pace is 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 their kryptonite, isn't it? Because they're both, to put it in a polite way, in the twilight years of their career. You know, you're talking about Chiellini, 36, 37. Bonucci is 34 as well. Um, pace is a problem for them. I I think where England can get at them is, is with Raheem Sterling in particular because of his ability to carry the ball into the box. And you saw how he won the penalty against Denmark, which he won. You know, it wasn't... He won that penalty. Yeah, I think like that. <laughs> I mean, he did beat three, four players. He was yeah. he's our main source of creativity from that standpoint. And and once somebody dribbles into the penalty area as a centre back, you, you automatically brick it, don't you? You don't want to make a challenge. You don't want to kick out. You don't want to make that clumsy sort of lean into them that results in a penalty. And I think that would be a could be a problem for those two. The only thing with those two is they're so streetwise and they're so experienced and. They are very well protected in this system. Uh, they do play a little bit higher up than they'd like. And you'll see that quite often when Italy don't have the ball, you'll see that Di Lorenzo from the right will tuck in yeah. and they become a bit more of a back three. Um, and, and that requires sort of whoever's playing on the right to drop back as well. So they're very sort of fluid in their shape and they adjust their shape in game quite often so that they can cater for maybe the lack of pace that those guys have. I expect Italy to drop off a little bit in terms of their starting position against England from fear of that. Uh, but equally, they will look to manage, I think, in the central areas uh, and manage England that way and keep England sort of going out to those wide areas because I don't think that they will particularly worry about Kane from a pace perspective. Yes, yeah, and 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 they're they're very interested. And in, and from watching them at Wembley, especially on Tuesday, where I was really kind of high up, you could see how compact they are. They're interested in defending the width of their penalty area above everything else, and they will trust in Bonucci and Chiellini to clean up anything that comes into the box. So Sterling is going to have to try and run at them if they, if he's going to break them down. But equally, they'll be happy for England to have the ball in that sort of area and put crosses in because th they'll feel they can defend that. That It's a great point because I think with Harry Kane, he was getting joy to a degree against Denmark in that first half where they were trying to press and they were trying to force England to just keep the ball around the defence. And the minute England could break that, Harry Kane's got so much space. And I do worry in this game, he isn't going to be afforded that same. Jorginho, for me, the way that he reads the game defensively as well it is a problem for us. And I think we think that Kane will drop a bit deeper, pull one of the two centre-backs out, and it'll be easy enough to get him beyond. But they are very street rise, and that's the problem. And I do worry about Kane when he drops so deep at times. We do need him in the area, and there's been a couple of occasions where Saka or Sterling have got him beyond, and he isn't there. So I do, I, I personally think that Southgate and Carry Kane have got to be braver in, in that sense. And he's got to... It's not in his game anymore. I did a video the other day and it's tough for Harry Kane because of the way he plays at Tottenham, but you need him in the box for the cutbacks because he's he's our main source of goals, really. Yeah, and, and you know, there, there won't be a 
better prepared team for this than Italy in terms of tactically. I mean, from sort of the last few years where I've been sort of covering Serie A a lot for work and stuff, you kind of come to realise how, and this is not a knock on the Premier League, but in terms of all the leagues in Europe, they are so far advanced in terms of defensive tactics and being aware and their preparation and their strategies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, they'll, they'll have done their homework and they'll know exactly what they want to do. I just, from a physical point of view, I don't know if they've got it in them to go to extra time, if that's the case. Um, you talk about some ageing players in that group and you talk about England having a greater strength in depth because they can bring a Grealish on, they can bring a Sancho on, they can bring, you know, a, a Henderson on in midfield. Yeah. For Italy, that isn't the case. You know, Locatelli and Berardi maybe would be the two subs that you look at as ones that are definitely going to happen. And beyond that, you're kind of just patching up certain areas. So I think England's strength in depth as well is is another big, big factor. That's been a feather in the cap for me. I, I think where we sometimes, we're not up there with maybe a Spain and Italy in terms of the, the, the playing style. Actually, Southgate's discipline game plan at times, his yeah. ability to, to even be stubborn with that at points, but bring on players that can just inject a bit of pace or a different idea. And you see that against Denmark and, and Denmark really couldn't cope with it. And Denmark did try to press us, to be fair. But when fatigue kicks in, this England side tend to take over. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about Jack Grealish because he... He's been a character in this tournament where he's just been a 20-minute player. And then even Southgate took him off the other day, which I thought a brave decision if it goes wrong and we come a little bit deeper and they score, but again, paid off. Do you, do you think he suits this type of game? Do you think he can... Because we're talking about players trying to get at the Italian defence. Is he someone that could maybe bait a, a Di Lorenzo into to making a foul or possibly getting a set piece from that? Yeah, I think he is, but you've got to... It's all dependent on what Gareth Southgate's kind of plan is, isn't it? I mean... If you're going to sit deep, sit off of Italy um, and look to hit them on the counter-attack and try and sort of draw them out, then I think I'm not sure that he's Grealish is the right man because I don't trust Grealish to get involved in the midfield scrap that there is undoubtedly going to be. You know, you talk about sort of Verratti and, and Barella, they're very sort of, they're those kind of players that they don't look big physically because they're not, but they're very yeah. intense. They're always snapping at people's heels. Italy this time around, and, and something they've never really done previously, is the way they press and hunt in packs. And, and I wouldn't trust Grealish to get back and protect for that. Um, equally, though, if you want to be on the front foot, if you plan to be on the front foot, and that's the way you want to approach the game, then Grealish is excellent at holding the ball. He's got the ability to dribble into those areas that I talked about and, and draw not just fouls, but players in and create room for others. I think Grealish is a fantastic player, but what Southgate's done really well is he's not he's not sort of buckled to the noise. He's not sort of got involved in all the sort of outside influence about Grealish playing, about Sancho playing, and he's done what he feels is right for each individual game. And it's why you've seen sort of changes ahead of every match. And I think that, that he's earned the right to to continue in the way that he sees fit based on, on the success he's had so far. Whatever happens, two semi-finals in a row for England, given where they've been, is incredible. So I think he's earned the right to be able to manage the game in whatever way he feels, whether it includes Grealish or not. I think you just got to trust him. It's tough as a as a massive fan of club football. There's been a real adjustment period, I think, for a lot of fans in terms of not. I think Southgate's helped that with, with obviously the results and getting fire in the tournament, but the way that we perceive tournament football. You know, we look and it, it, it's really nice to see Italy and Spain. They, for me, they play almost club style football, and that probably owed to their managers. But it, again, the, the pace of it's very different. The management of it's very different, and, and certain managers like Southgate, who wasn't massively successful at club level. He's all right at tournament level. And to be fair to him, he's disciplined and he's got a plan. It's just, I just wonder whether England can compete with the pace of Italy. That's my only concern. And I think it might be down to Italy tiring that England start to take over. But I think a lot of England fans have got to maybe temper their expectations with this game. I think it is a game for us to be defensive. Do you think he could go with a back three or even a back five at times just to try and accommodate Italy and, and maybe hurt them in the wide areas? Because for me, I feel 4 2 3 1 is a little bit brave. Yeah, it, it might be a little bit brave, but I, if Italy played with a back three all the time, I would say that he would go with a back three. You saw him mirror it, didn't you, against Germany 
where he kind of felt that Germany were, were probably on paper at least the slightly stronger side and he felt like he needed to do that to deal with them. With Italy, it's, it's different, I think, because you're talking about how important or we're talking about how important the midfield is going to be in this match. And I'm not sure that playing with two in the middle is enough. No. And and to play that back three, you would need to sacrifice one from the middle, I'd assume. And I think that having Rice, Phillips and Mount, if it's those three, is going to be crucial. Because if you give Italy the upper hand, the extra man in midfield, they'll play the ball around you all day long. Um, it allows Jorginho to drop that little bit deeper without England having anybody who can get on him quickly. And if you let him pull the strings, then you've got problems. Um, whereas if you've got the three midfielders and you can go man for man and you can press and you can press uh, as a unit and in, in packs, if you like, you can you can make it uncomfortable for Italy's midfield. So I would probably stay with the 4-2-3-1, but there's got to be some kind of adjustments to it. So, for example, against Denmark, you saw Saka expose that channel, didn't he, in between yeah. um, the, the left sort of centre-back and the, the central centre-back. That's not going to happen with Italy because they'll be too narrow. They won't let it happen. Their defensive philosophy is based on keeping it compact. And as I said previously, they will want to force you out to the wide areas. They'll let you go out on the outside of them. And that's where players like Saka, if he plays Sterling, can be invaluable because their ability to dribble the ball and carry the ball. I think England need to be disciplined, but also recognise that they do have the, the weapons to hurt Italy. This Italy side are not unbeatable. They're not, you know, yeah. they're not gods. That you know, Spain completely dominated them, um, but they are streetwise. And if you don't take your opportunities when they come, they've got the mentality to hang on in there and, and punish you, sort of when it gets to the later stages. So it's a game you have got to be wary of them. But I don't think you should be fearful if that makes sense. I am. <laughs> I am. I just. <laughs> I, I think. I think it's just that. Again, I think we've just got to be really conservative. I, I think if I if I'd seen something from England before where we were really aggressive at pressing, you look at Italy, the way that they do it in the packs and they win it and they regain. I know England have done it in spells, but not consistently. And I, I don't trust them. I can I can foresee a situation where Verratti, Barella, and Jorginho are playing the ball around our midfield. And again, I, I think. Being really conservative in this game, keeping it tight, but trying to possibly use wing backs. I think pace on the outside, maybe where we get him behind. Possibly you've got Luke Shaw. If he, I don't think he'll use Trippier. I think he could use someone like maybe a Reese James. I don't know, and try and stretch it a little bit. But it's it's a it's a nightmare. But you are you are right. I just can't foresee how it will happen. I think we just wear him down, and the transition's important. You know, if, if Italy are caught out, then I think that's where England thrive. And to be fair, I've been yeah. really impressed with Raheem Sterling in this tournament. You know, he come in and his form for, for club had been really, really poor, but he stepped up. Saka's another one. As an Arsenal fan, it must be quite nice to see Saka, 19 years old, comes to the international stage. And and even sometimes where, I'm not, I don't say he goes missing in games, he, he maybe he needs to grow into it. When he gets into his flow and he, and he eyes up a, a centre-back or, or a wide player, he takes them on. He's really positive and, and we need that in this side. Yeah, he's he, he's so brave and composed for a nineteen-year-old, and that's what what Arsenal fans have been sort of banging on about him for like all season. It's the way he just takes situations in his stride and doesn't get phased by them. You know, you got to think for Arsenal as well. This is a kid who is a right winger and was originally brought into the Arsenal side to cover at left back, yeah. and so to kind of play that position over a period of time, play it well, develop, learn that position, probably improve his game defensively by this time. And then to be given the opportunity on the right wing where he wants to play on the left wing, he's, he's thrived. He's played in the number 10 role for Arsenal as well. Um, his versatility and his kind of awareness and understanding of the game in so many different positions is why he is such a good asset to the squad. You know, in a, if you're talking about a purely attacking sense, I would probably argue that Jaden Sancho would probably give you more. Mm. Or, you know, there, there are other players, Grealish, Foden might give you more. But Saka's in the team because he's he can do different jobs and he allows you to be tactically flexible. You know, Gareth Southgate could identify an issue in midfield, for example, after 15 minutes where he's seen, I don't know, Barella pulling out to the left-hand side and picking up a bit of extra space. And he can say to Bukayo Saka, 
get yourself in that hole and, and get on him and mark him and cause him problems. And, and you can trust Saka to do that because he's got so much sort of awareness and, and ability around playing in different positions. And, and that's why he's key for me. And what Southgate's done brilliantly is, as I said before, he doesn't listen to what, what everybody's shouting at. He's done his analysis. He's done his homework in a way that I don't think an England manager has done before. And he's identifying weaknesses in teams and he's looking to capitalise on that. It's not being scared. It's not being um, ca overly cautious. It's being respectful of your opponent. And I think England in the past can be accused of having been uh, a little bit arrogant in certain situations yeah. and, not, and falling apart. I agree. I think there's... Listen, I know we've got some fantastically talented players. But I hope this tournament's showing people that it isn't just about a fantasy team throwing in the best players. I'd, listen, I'd love to watch Jack Grealish play for England for 90 I really would. But the reason why Saka is... You can rely on Saka is his vers a, his versatility. He's so intelligent. The work that he does off the ball, having played so many positions. And to be 19, to be able to do that. You know, as a West Ham fan, I've seen Declan Rice transition from a centre-back to a defensive midfielder. And it's taken him really two, three years to get to the level that he's at. For Saka, for me, it comes out of nowhere and he's able to play multiple positions. I wonder whether the next generation coming through for England, hopefully, they do offer that versatility because the Italians are, are able to play in different positions and, and change on the pitch. In England, we struggle a little bit, but fair play. I think Southgate manages it. He knows the players that can play in the right way and you bring them late on. Sancho and Grealish may feel slightly hard done by, you know, given their talent levels and given how they can influence games, but... Listen, I think like Greeley said to Southgate the other day, I don't really care as long as we get to the final. And exactly. listen, no one's moaning if, if we win 1-0 or we win it on pens. It's a horrible performance because win a trophy in my lifetime. But that's the classic though, isn't it? Like where the media try and make an issue out of something that to the player himself wasn't even an issue. Like I, I'm sure that Jack Grealish had the reasons he was taken off explained to him. Gareth Southgate even gave an interview on the radio after the game and he said, I knew that Denmark were going to throw four players forward because that's what they've done in previous games. I had to sacrifice one of Foden and Grealish and I felt that Foden would give me a bit more defensively and he, he didn't want to take Sterling off. He explained it and that should be the end of it. That should be a line drawn under it. But, you know, there's yeah. always this... Let's try and create a bit of controversy. Let's create. Know, even, even I was thinking, come on, I'm not being funny. We've got to a final. I don't, I don't really get it. Grealish got taken off. If you know, Declan got taken off. I was thinking, what are we doing here? But Henderson comes on and he gives an injection of energy, and it's exactly what we need. You just, I think England fans, we just got to trust him at this point. But Harry, I don't want to waste too much of your time. Before I let you go, give me a score prediction and make it nice for him. <laughs> this is a tough one. This is a tough one. I've been getting battered the last sort of week or so because, um. Because I've said that, you know, I quite, I've quite fancied Italy to win the tournament. And I think England just just nick this. I, I really do. And, and for the reasons that we've discussed, I feel like physically they're at a, a higher level. I feel like they've got more depth. I think we've seen substitutions and, and stuff make massive differences in games at this tournament. Because largely, you know, we've, we've been for a really strange season. So... I'm going to say England to win this in extra time. That's going to be my my sort of prediction. Um, yeah. I think it'll be nil-nil in 90 minutes. I think it'll be incredibly cagey. I don't expect Italy to over uh, uh, sort of overstretch themselves. I think they'll try and keep it compact. They'll be aware of all the threats that we've talked about. Equally, I think Gareth Southgate's not stupid enough to throw the kitchen sink at them and get caught out either. So I think it's going to be a cagey encounter. Probably be decided on one moment, and I'd imagine it will come in extra time. I've got a horrible feeling this has got pens written all over it. Like oh, I genuinely have got this horrible feeling where it's going to get to penalties. And the worst thing would be if we if we lost it on penalties, the, the whole nation just get, is up in arms. Like, what are we doing? But I think, to be fair, to most England fans at this stage, you know, we've done really well to get to this point of the tournament. And for me, it's just, I'm just, in, I can't wait to see what happens. I can't wait to see us compete with an Italian side. And I feel like on the balance of play, these are the two best sides in the tournament so far. Yeah, for sure. out, one, one out of possession, one definitely in possession. Let's see what, what happens. But I think you're spot on. I think it's cagey. I think it's tight. I think we're going to have to sit on our hands for large periods of the game where Italy are playing it around. But everything crossed. I mean, if, if West Ham are in a cup final one time, I mean, I'll be like this. I'll be even worse. <laughs> but I just every, everything's crossed, man. Everything's crossed. Listen, Harry, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me, man. Plug, plug your channel. Let them know where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me on uh, Chronicles of Aguna. It's an Arsenal podcast, so I can't imagine you guys would be too interested in it unless we're playing you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, check it out. And you can find me on uh, 90 Min as well. Uh, so subscribe to 90 Min too. 
probably not last season, mate, to be fair, after we bottled 3 0 up. I mean, it was like <laughs> it was like when Tottenham bottled their 3 0 against us. I just couldn't take it. But it, no. was, it was one of those ones, right, where I was uh, I was watching the game and I, I, I celebrated the third Arsenal goal quite strongly. And then I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, what am I doing? Like, we were so shit to be like <laughs> no well we were so we were so for 20 minutes i couldn't believe how well west ham were playing i, I genuinely couldn't believe it it was that easy i think it was saka that was a bit of a game changer in that game again yeah, it was, uh, yeah. we didn't know what to do with ourselves harry we'll just put it down to lack of experience being 3 nil up and then we went on a couple of weeks after that getting 3 nil up and conceding too but listen mate once again, thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Drop a like on the video if you did enjoy it. More content leading up to the final. I'm absolutely buzzing. Take care.